Here in Devon, in the tranquil Tamar Valley, was once a port bustling with industry. Now more Wellham Quay is to be brought back to life, as it would have been during the reign of King Edward VII. Archaeologists Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn and historian Ruth Goodman will be living the lives of Edwardian farmers for a full calendar year. That's fantastic, all hand forged. It's going to be an enormous challenge whoa, whoa. to get to grips with the skills and crafts of the early 20th century. Here on the banks of the River Tamar, farming was about far more than just livestock and crops. Farmers had to diversify into fishing. Oh, wow, we got something. Mining. Market gardening. And master the industrial advances of the Edwardian age. It was a time of inventors and entrepreneurs and great social change. Over the next 12 episodes, the team are going back to an age that saw the dawn of our modern world and a time of new and exciting ventures on the Edwardian farm. It's September, and Alex, Ruth and Peter must establish themselves in Edwardian Britain. This means setting up home. Oh, my goodness. Can't live with it like this. The arrival of their first livestock. You've got control there, Alex. Yeah, I'd sort of. And fertilising the fields to grow crops. For this, they must make deadly quicklime. Wow, there's no going back now. A hazardous but essential job. Oh dear, this is killing me. On the Edwardian farm. The team are getting ready for their new adventure. My dad called me odd head for a number of years. That was kind. The Edwardian age began with the death of Queen Victoria in 1901, when her son, Edward VII, became king. It was to last until the outbreak of the Great War in 1914. So you excited about our new adventure, Peter? Very much so. You can think about it, it's an incredibly exciting age, isn't it? Age of the wireless, there's an explosion in, in daily newspapers as well. And, of course, the motor car means that people can get around that much quicker. Flight. And, like, the difference between the, the rich and the poor, too. I mean, at this point, it's at its most extreme, the social divides between aristocrats and, and you know, the next layers down. It's an age of exuberance. The salad days, you might say, before the, uh, the hell of the First World War. I really do like the beard, but I think it should go. I never realised how handsome you were, Peter. <laughs> Thank you very much, that's fantastic. Oh, that looks really weird, doesn't it? Really different. Time to step into a board in Britain. <gasps> the River Tamar, the border between Devon and Cornwall. The adventure begins. Mm. The team are sailing from Plymouth, 18 miles upriver, to their new home at Moor Wellham. Is that it, through the mist? That's obviously it. Gosh. It's quite eerie. Like a ghost town, isn't it? It is. Huge water wheel as well. Oh, yeah. <gasps> Look at this place. Stunning, isn't it? Absolutely fantastic. Right, well, first ashore, me and Sonny. <laughs> yeah, after you, Ruth. Thanks ever so much. <gasps> this is more Wellham Quay. At its height, this was one of the busiest ports in Britain, shipping locally mined copper ore to South Wales for smelting. Pleased to meet you. Anthony Powers will be their land agent for the year. Nice to meet you. Pleasant journey. 
very much so. Yes, what thank a place. you. Well, absolutely, yes. And you've arrived exactly the right way on, on the river because it's the river that's, that's so important for this place. It was a, a, a way of getting out all the minerals that are mined around here because it's really, this is a hugely important mining district. Ships are going up and down here carrying all sorts of goods, copper, tin, arsenic, lead, um, limestone, all sorts of things going up and down this really river. Really heavy so stuff. Like a really heavy stuff, right. yes, yeah, yes. Much easier yes. to do on a yeah. river, isn't it? Absolutely, like, yes. Apart from all the mining, what else was going on on this site? You've got a farm, of course. I mean, really, to, to, to feed the, the industrial workforce that was in the area. And then we've got market gardening as well, just, just coming in, really coming on to full steam in the, in the Edwardian period, and they're growing uh, cherries, strawberries, daffodils. Right, okay. um, Sort of cash crops, really, actually. Fantastic. And would we be expected to turn our hands to a little bit of everything? I think you would. I think you would. I think it's a time where people are, they're maybe their traditional um, forms of, of earning a living are, are maybe getting a you know, slight, slightly bit dodgy, and so they're having to look around for other things as well. But with all these other industries aside, our, our core industry is going to be the farm for us. So I think Peter and I better go off and, and have a look at that. Have a look and see how you I'd get like it on. I'd like to see where we're living, actually. Right. Shall we I go think I'd rather get that sorted <laughs> out first. There's a bit of work to do there, but we'll oh. have a look, shall we? This is where the team will experience Edwardian domestic life. A little bit basic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a reasonable sized family here. I think probably you got a family of um, two parents and six children. In this house. <laughs> so you need a big kitchen. You need a fairly them. big space, don't you? <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah, yeah especially yeah. as this is the room you spend most of your time living and working in. Yeah. It's a pretty small range, isn't it? It's very small. There's no hot water tank on it, is Not there? Not at all, no. I think you must have, they must have been heating water on, on the top in pans there. Yeah. That's small. Oh, and I've got a sink. Have you got have water? got a sink. You have got a sink. Um, you haven't got water, no. There's no running water down here. So OK, yeah. so it's back to carrying buckets. It is, I'm afraid. So yeah. I've got my work cut out then, haven't I? You have, yeah. The team are taking charge of Morwellum Farm originally built to feed the people that worked and lived at the port. Wow, Peter. Look at this selection of vehicles. God, oh, look at this. This water wheel once powered the farm's machinery. Big, isn't it? It's clear that farming in Devon will be different from anything they've experienced before. So they'll need local knowledge. They're calling on someone with a lifetime's farming experience, Mr. Francis Mudge. The Mudge family have farmed the land here in Devon for generations. So this is going to be our farm for the year then? The most pressing concern is working out what crops to grow. Do you think this will make a good arable field, Mr Mudge? Oh, yeah, this, this one is not too bad, really, for that, that sort of thing. That to any crop in here, from corn, potatoes, kale... Right. ..mangoes, anything you like, you know. Right. We were thinking of putting in a grain, either a barley or an oats, and maybe a, a crop of potatoes, basically one, one to thrash yeah. and one to mash. It would be better to till oats, really, because... You can feed your horses and that with oats, and, and what's left over you give your cattle and things like that. So we're so, looking for some oats then as yeah. our cereal crop. Yep. Peter and I are both thinking about potatoes because it was a bit of a cash crop in the period. So what about potatoes? Well, yeah, you tell a few potatoes that they would grow well here, like you know, and provided you kept your, you'd have to keep your lime hot. In Devon, Edwardian farmers applied alkaline quicklime to their fields. This neutralised the acidity of the soil caused by the granite bedrock of neighbouring Dartmoor. I mean, if we decided to kind of shortcut this and, and, and not lime the fields, what would happen to the crops? You only have half a crop, you wouldn't you would have a very good crop. How much lime do you think we'll need for this field? Well, you, I would say you will put about two tonnes of the acre on it now. Right, right. well, we're probably looking at up to about 10 tonne here if we go for the whole field, but I don't know, anywhere between five and six tonne, maybe, if we do two-thirds, half. You, you do all that, and you, you should have good, good luck for your crops and everything else, like, you know. But, um... OK, then. We'll get to it, then. Find ourselves some lime, Peter. Yeah. This is a huge challenge. To successfully grow crops, Alex and Peter must find a way of making ten tonnes of quicklime fertiliser. 
At the cottage, Ruth's already busy. The Edwardian way of scrubbing the floor is quite precise. Instead of just splashing water everywhere, you work square by square. So each square is scrubbed wet and dried off, rinsed and re-scrubbed and dried off before you move on to the next square. Oh, it's been a while since this was done. Look at the filth coming off. What it means is that I can maintain me and my clothes reasonably clean because it means I'm not swimming about, kneeling down in a whole load of water all the time. <laughs> There's lots of references to many farmhouse wives doing this twice a day. I don't think I'm going to be that house proud. Once will do plenty. Right, that's that done. Where should we put this? Uh, yeah, over this way, yeah. This will do fine, won't it? We can always yeah. move it. Yeah, I'm really pleased with this. It's a really nice cottage Edwardian dresser, you know, made out of pine and stained and pretending to be out of oak. Nah, I'm quite excited about this, you know. So what's in here? Edwardian provisions. Wow, <laughs> looks like you're not going to have to make many products. Pickled Ed onions. Marmalade. This is starting to look like my mother's cupboard at home. A lot of familiar designs. I'm just amazed at how many companies are still in business. Oh, Brasso, look Brasso. at that. I mean, there were loads of branded products in the Victorian period, but it's just gone crazy by the Edwardian. There's just so many more of them. And, and they're beginning to sort of target them at different groups of people, aren't you? You're getting some advertising going, aiming at the working classes. Things like the Sunlight Soap being mm. aimed at everybody. And some things that are really being aimed at the middle classes. Go. End of a long journey for you guys. So this is going to be the first of our livestock on the farm. These are my chickens I've brought over. And they're light Sussex is the breed. They're going to mix in with these buff Orpingtons for a while. But you know what? I really fancy getting together a nice industrial sort of poultry concern on an Edwardian scale. There we go, boy. Quiet this one. So now we're going to have to look out for some uh, cows, some pigs and some sheep and get this farm properly stocked. Well, this is home for a year. It's looking nice. Yeah, it is, isn't it? have struck upon the most fantastic location. We've got everything. We've got the river, we've got the coast, we've got a fantastic farm, we've got a fantastic mining heritage and the market garden heritage. There's going to be so much to do, so much to keep us busy. It's quite an opportunity, really, a place that is so abandoned. <laughs> the chance to bring it back to turn the clock back and make a place live and breathe and hum, busy with people and life again. I think that myself, Alex and Ruth have a burning ambition inside us. And perhaps we do bite off a little more than we can chew. But I just hope that I'll be able to learn new skills, do right by the animals and um, try my hardest. Until the range is up and running, they can't cook or have hot water. But there's a problem. Sneak out. Ooh! Can't live with it like this. Ruth turns to their land agent, Anthony, for advice. Hi, Anthony. Hello, how are you? I'm having a nightmare with it. I've given it a really, really good clean, well, as best as I can. It's clogged solid, absolutely solid. 
So the chimney needs cleaning for a start. Yes. I cleaned the chimney in there last year and um, had to get on the roof and knock a plug about this wide out <laughs> down through the chimney because jackdaws, twigs and all sorts of yeah, stuff. Yeah, so. which they do. It's cool. A blockage in the chimney may be sending the smoke back into the room. You all right, Alex? Yep, I'm good. How's it going with our little volunteer? Yeah, he's, uh, he's looking ripe and ready for it. To sweep it, Alex has a cunning plan. One of the traditional ways with which to clean your chimney out was with chicken. And what you do, get him here, and you literally stuff him down the chimney. And what he does is he tries to flap up the chimney, to fly up the chimney, and in doing so, his claws scratch the inside of the flue and bring down all the soot with him. But I've got to be honest, I really can't bear to do it to the little fella because he's so gorgeous. So. I'm just going to let him get about his business. And we're going to go for plan B. <laughs> what went wrong with plan A? Lack of volunteers. <laughs> plan B involves Holly rather than a chicken to clean the chimney. OK. Right, OK. We're ready. Ends in. Start hauling. Pull it up. Here we go. This is a really old method of cleaning chimneys. Goes back to the medieval period, stuff a holly bush down. There's loads coming down just as you pull it up. Don't pull him off. I'm not pulling I know, him I, off. Yeah. You can pull it back down now, then, Peter. OK, pulling away. Yeah, I see. He's, oh, he's the man with the muscles. How's it going? Work to treat. I think we've doubled the size of the chimney. At the farm, the most pressing concern is neutralising the acidic soil with quicklime. Ten tonnes of it. Quicklime was a wonder material of the Edwardian age. Not only was it used in farming, but it was the basis of cement and plaster. It's made by heating limestone, essentially chalk, to over 900 degrees in a kiln. Our first bit of lime something almost every Edwardian town would have had. These are the raw materials for our lime burn. We've got the limestone here and the coal, all brought in by barge. Most effective way to bring it in. So now we've got the raw materials, Peter, we just have to find ourselves a kiln. Okay. So here's our lime kiln, then. Anthony's brought the boys to the kilns at Morwellum Quay. It's actually it's one of two, and they actually probably were being used up until the Edwardian period. Um, limestone brought up from quarries on, uh, from Oreston on the outskirts of Plymouth, all built over now, and, and coal from South Wales. And, and to make quick lime, which is what you need for your fields, you basically burn layers of limestone with coal, right. um, and it converts the limestone into this stuff called quick lime, the lump lime, quite small pieces, which you can then pull out from the bottom, and that's what you then spread on your fields. Well, Mr Mudge reckons we need approximately 10 tonnes of lump lime to go on our fields. Well, do we need to measure it and find out exactly how much, how much I, this is going to make, think, then? I think we should. Because yeah. we could end up with, with heaps of it all over the place, <laughs> and goodness knows what we're going to do with it, then. Rather than a little bit extra. Yes, yes. <laughs> At the cottage, it's the moment of truth. Crackle, baby, crackle. Oh, I can see the smoke going sideways. <laughs> That's a good sign. That is warm already. That's how it's supposed to be. On the continent by the Edwardian period, people were abandoning coal cooking like nobody's business, moving over to the new gas. But here, we hung on to ranges a lot longer. So they were still manufacturing them right up until the end of the 1930s. I wonder if you can see it going up the chimney. If I have a look in this inspection. <laughs> yeah, you can. Zooming up there. Look at that drawer on that. Measuring the kiln is proving to be a mathematical challenge. Five times five is 25. Yeah. 
Times by pi, what's pi? 3.14? Make it three. Okay, 75. <laughs> Times that by the uh, depth. How are we going to work out the depth? <laughs> if you hold one end and abseil down... <laughs> <laughs> so, 20 times 75, that's uh, 2 times 750. 1,500. 1,500, that's cubic feet. How many tonnes is that? I've no idea. <laughs> that's over 50 tonnes of quicklime. They need just 10. It's highly caustic <laughs> stuff, Peter. A tonne of it is bad enough, and you want 50 tonnes of it. We're, we're, OK, OK. <laughs> it's the end of the first week on the Edwardian farm, and already the challenges are mounting up. We're next to one of the world's biggest granite deposits, which means the entirety of the soil around here is going to be acidic. So we're going to have to do something to combat that. If we're to stand any chance of growing anything in it, we're going to need a whole load of lime. Quick lime. Hmm. And they do have the lime well, we kilns are, yeah, down exactly. here. Yeah, exactly. We're right next to a set of lime kilns. Well, I, I think those are a little bit too big. Is the worm turning? No, the Ruth, worm When the worm Peter is not... first clapped eyes on those lime kilns, right, right. he was like, we're going to do a burn. We're going to do a burn. His eyes lit up. And I'm like, Peter, what's, what's the tonnage? Well, if there's a critical mass, you see, so you, uh, gotta, you, can't, uh, uh, uh. you can't... You can't just do a teeny yeah. bit, yeah. No. So if we're going to do three quarters of full, we're looking at 45 tonne of lime uh. to 10 tonnes of coal <laughs> to 12 feet <laughs> of, of wood. Well, I was going to say I could do with some lime, but I don't think I need that much. So you're, you're sort of backing out, Peter, here? <laughs> I, I, I think we'd probably end up doing a smaller kiln just because of the amount of lime we actually need. In Edwardian times, there were thousands of lime kilns across Britain. Now there's just a handful, so finding a smaller kiln that's still working isn't going to be easy. Until they get some lime, their arable project's on hold. So the farmers turn their attention to livestock. Go on, girls. Go on. Local farmer Matthew Cole is delivering an Edwardian breed of sheep that's particular to this region. Stay there, stay there, stay there, stay there, stay there. Stay there, stay there, stay there. Make, make. Good dogs, good dogs. Go. Lovely looking animals. Yes. Yeah. And these are white-faced animals. Right. right. These sheep have been on this on these hills for, for centuries. They look quite small. Yeah, they are, they are hill sheep. Right. Um, you know, they've evolved on Dartmoor, which is, you know, a large granite outcrop. The, the wind blows and the rain comes down, and, yeah. uh, you know, these girls have evolved to cope with that. As a result, their body size isn't that big, but, you know, they make good use of the, of the rough forage and, uh, you know, what's available to them, really. They've right. evolved for the area. And are they bred just for their meat, or...? These, these would probably have been one of the first dual-purpose animals. You know, they, not only do they grow a good, heavy fleece, but the meat is also of very high quality. They call it angel meat. It's, it's that... A angel meat. Angel meat. It's that tasty. Great, well, they're certainly settling in. Yeah. Thank you very much for bringing yeah, them down. Yeah, thanks so much for bringing them down. And Meg, thank you, Meg, as well. Yeah. She did the hard work. Yeah. <laughs> Crucial to the success of their sheep enterprise will be keeping them well fed over winter. In Edwardian times, this river was the only way to deliver heavy cargo into Moor Wellham, deep in the Tamar Valley. This is our first consignment of hay. We'll need plenty to keep our cattle and our sheep fed throughout the winter. Unfortunately, in the Edwardian period, it came ready baled. So we've got a nice empty hayloft to get filled up and we should nearly be there for our winter feed. Today, the only Tamar barge that's fully operational is this one, the Shamrock, skippered by Peter Allington. It's really funny, isn't it? You know, you sort of look at a sailing barge with no engines and you think, oh, really out of date by the Edwardian period, but that's just not true, is it? An awful lot of sailing barges were... So yes, um, I think the barge skipper relied on three things. 
wind power, muscle power and tidal power, <laughs> or probably a combination of <laughs> just, several of them. You know, I mean, apart from the railway, which of course is several miles that way, yeah. getting anything in or out of this valley, this is really the only way to do yes. it, isn't it? Particularly with any bulk cargo. Yeah. If you're talking of Morwell ham, people immediately think of copper ore. Yeah. Um, but you could have uh, barges bringing in coal. Some of the coasting schooners that came up here, you know, they came as from as far as West Russia with timber, so... Yeah, that's I an interesting was, thought um, too, isn't it? This is an international link. Yes. Yeah, this is yes. not some little backwater. This, no. is, this is really connected. Having taken delivery of the hay, it must be stored in a dry place. <laughs> Right, you ready for this? Yeah. Right, here we go. Lovely job. It seemed a lot coming off the boat, but now we've got it here. Doesn't seem that much. This isn't going to last us though, is it, Peter? Throughout the winter, and this <coughs> hayloft is desperately small, so we're going to have to see, firstly, if we can source ourselves some hay locally, and secondly, have to find some way of storing it outside. Alex is consulting their Edwardian farming manual on how to store hay outside. It recommends building a hay rick. So we've managed to acquire the most up-to-date version of the book of the farm to help us through the year. And I'm just looking at some of the uh, hay ricks or hay stacks, as it's called here. Um, and we're quite interested in uh, the, the, the shape of this one, which is very much what we're trying to achieve. To keep the hay dry, it advises that the rick is thatched. Lucky we found these old timbers, Peter. <laughs> Yeah, we'll do just a job for our rack, which to build a rick. <laughs> but rain's not the only obstacle they have to overcome. There's also vermin. The solution is to build it off the ground, on staddle stones. The design of this stone, and this goes back hundreds of years, is, 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 is so designed, essentially, so that rats, they climb up to here, to get into your corn, and of course they just can't get over the edge. Okay, so it stops vermin, at least mammals anyway, getting into your corn. The boys have bought some more hay from a local farm. They need to build the rick before the wet weather sets in. Well, we better start getting this on the rick. <coughs> if the hay gets damp, Indeed, if it gets saturated and we can't dry it out, it's quite simple, it rots. It loses all of its nutritional value. So it's, it's, uh, it's next to useless. So that's a disaster. This, this is going to be like the best part of a week's work, if not more. Yeah, but it's going to feed our livestock for how long? Several months? It's going to be worth it in the end, Alex. As well as hay, the livestock will also need grain. In Devon, farmers would have used granite troughs to keep the feed off the ground and prevent it being contaminated by animal excrement. In Edwardian times, they were hand-carved by the inmates of Dartmoor Prison. Peter's come to see stonemason Ian Piper at a quarry on Bodmin Moor. Hello, Peter. Hi, Ian. How are you? Nice to meet you. You too. You too. Very well, thank you. The first job is to choose a suitable piece of granite. I mean, you didn't want it too large, did you? No, not too large. So, I mean, what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to cut it down through there. So we're going to drill holes right around there and down that side and slit it down. Ian's using an Edwardian pneumatic crane to lift the granite block from the quarry. It's a tense moment. This crane hasn't been used in half a century. Seems to be working. Now the stone must be cut down to size. And this is one of the hardest rocks in the world. 
and it is one of the most amazing building materials. But there is a grain in it, so you can't just chop it any way. It's going to be quite interesting to see how they do this. Granite is cut by drilling a series of holes by hand. This is the hand drill. This is the hand drill. Right. You think that's all they had to do it with? Like they had to drill holes around like that by hand. How far does that have to go in? You want to go down about three and a half, four inches. Three and a half, four inches. It's a fair old way. Yeah. Imagine coming to work and having to do that all day long. Yeah, I know. And there's a chap doing that all day long. Yeah. Hard life. They were hard men, there was no yeah. debate. I reckon uh, you should give them a break. It's time for Peter to try his hand at drilling granite. Apparently you get used to hitting your thumbs. Oh man, that is an absolute killer. <laughs> Just doing that, my lord. With a cold hand as well. With the professionals back on the job within an hour, the holes are drilled. Now the stone can be split. That's the, what we call the plug, plugs and feathers. Plugs and feathers. So it's obviously as you drive those, it'll split the stone out. You just keep hitting them. Yeah, one after the other. Yeah. yeah. This is the most critical part of the whole procedure. A clean break is essential, but they've got one chance to get it right. That's it. He's, he's gone down there. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, that's excellent. With the granite block cut to size now, they can hollow it out to make the trough. It's a job that will take days. Do you reckon a sort of farmer would have been able to split his own granite stone? No. No. Farmers we know in Boulder do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or it from milk on a cow, but not, not <laughs> splitting granite. It's mid-September. Alex and Peter hope they've stored enough hay to feed the livestock. They must ensure it's kept dry all winter. You've got the old book of the farm there. Edwardians would have thatched a rick, rather like a cottage. Hello, Keith. Good to see you again. Thatchers Keith Payne and Bill Liversidge have come to help. Nice to see you. So what do you think then? Yeah. Well, I'm impressed, Alex. It's so much neater than I thought it might be. Have a look at that. Good. Now, Alex has read about an ingenious way the Edwardians mechanised thatching. Yeah, the idea of that machine is that you can put reed through it, uh, thatching reed, it stitches it together and um, it comes out in a continuous mat. I, put, I push the reed through, uh, keeping it the same thickness all the way through. Instead of spending weeks thatching a rick, they would only sp spend a few hours, which gave them time to do hedging and stone walling and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, it was a labour saver as well, really. I'm actually feeding this through um, the same as uh, you, you would cloth through a sewing machine. Try not to pull it too much, otherwise right, you, might okay. cock, you might cock the, the works up. Oh. Whoa. Oh dear, Bill, sorry. I've um, just taken my eye off the ball here a second and we've dropped the stitch. Well, you, you really have got to concentrate on what you're about, mine. Otherwise, right. uh, if this comes undone on the rick, we, we, we're going to have a, a, a wet, wet spot on the rick. So yeah. if you could pay attention a bit more. And I'm sorry, Bill. Stop looking around. There you are. In she That's goes. Good, good as new. I reckon to be quicker to thatch it in the old traditional way and employ you two to end it with this thatch mat making machine. Back and then stop and then cut. There. Ruth's daughter Eve is visiting and helping to make the cottage more homely. So we're making a rag rug, or we're trying to make a rag rug for the floor. The floors are pretty hard in here. You start the base, there's a 
It's a sack, it's a Hessian sack. And then it's whatever bits of old fabric you've got, and you're better off with nice warm wool because that's going to be warmer underfoot. I mean, they cost absolutely nothing, rag rugs. Nobody's going to miss an old sack. And it just makes the whole kitchen feel warm and comfortable and homely. And it's safe scrubbing the floor. I'm getting so good at this. Da, 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 da. It actually feels like a rug now as well. Yeah. Well, just carry on, dear. <laughs> Cheers, Mum. <laughs> Here's the end. Right. The thatch making machine has produced enough matting to cover the rick. Now the tricky part, attaching it. Right, with these pegs, Alex, we want two along this edge, OK? In here and in there, yeah? yeah? I'm going to twist them in the middle so they become like a grip. Yeah. Double twist. Nice and soft on your hands, then. Yeah. Points upwards, OK? Then it doesn't course water into the middle of the stack. Sort of coming in like that, Coming yeah. on that top string and try to catch that string with the first one. Yeah, nice like that. Uphill. Yes. Going uphill. Yeah, drive them in with your hands. Got them in there like that. Lovely. And then, and then... give them the last touch. <laughs> oh, look at that. No hands. <laughs> Traditionally, this rick would have been thatched by lashing bundles of straw to the roof, a process that would have taken six hours. Last few fixings. Using the machine made mats takes just 40 minutes. Oh, there we go. One waterproof rig. Good job. Thank well, lads, you you've done an excellent job. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be waterproof. Well, let's hope so. Uh, just one little thing that I think you ought to be wary of when you uncover it and feed it to the animals in the winter. Right. Just be aware of the, the spores, the white spores that come out, because it will give you a thing called farmer's lung. Right. And it will give you breathing problems in the, in the future. So right. I would suggest that when you uncover it, you do wear a mask. Mm. But other than that, I'm sure it will stay nice and dry, and yeah. the animals will appreciate it in the winter, you, the hard work you put into it. Making the rag rug has proved a much bigger job than Ruth imagined. I'm almost there. I'm so close. <coughs> the amount of fabric that's used in the end is... Um, well, it's huge, actually. I think, frankly, it would, it would equate to about three double blankets. Oh, there we go. Me rag rug. But when it does eventually wear out, a thing that's made from scraps and other people's rubbish will go on the compost heap and be useful yet again. The ewes have settled into life on the farm, but to rear lambs, they'll need a ram. Matthew Cole has returned to Moor Wellham with a present for the boys. Good to see Hello. you again, Matthew. And you? Who's this? This is Cyril. Cyril. Oh, yes, yeah. fantastic. That's what a ram should look like, Peter. Yeah, probably four or five years old. His horns are like the rings on a tree. You can see right. You right. how old he is. What's he going to give us in terms of our, our, the offspring? His offspring? are going to be your next crop, if you like, right. with, with, in terms of lambs. So you're looking for a good, broad body right back through, and you're looking for, you know, back through here, you've got all your chops. Yeah. You've got your two shoulders, you want plenty of meat there. Yeah. And then you've got your two expensive legs, your legs right. of lamb at the back. That really is the sort of money that's, end, That's the it? money end. In order to tell the thickness of the skin on a sheep, which tells you how hard he is, you just, just feel his ear and you feel how thick it is. You know, that's that's... Proper leathery, proper thick. The thickness of that ear, basically, that's going to tell you how thick the skin is. That's right. And, and, and that'll that give you a, a representation of how hard, hard, you know, well he's going to resist the weather. Really. Well, I think uh, he's quite eager by the looks of it. Yeah, so. yeah he's Soon making my arms ache. Is he? Okay. <laughs> Let's get him out there. You've got control there, Alex. Yeah, I'd sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Just hold him there. Don't let the hold dog him. see the rabbit. Right. Ready to send nice him in? Time. Okay then. Go on, chap. Come on, Cyril. There we are. There's no messing, is there? Oh, no, no. Well, there we go. You'll notice him walk around behind him. She stands still. Yeah. It's game on. It doesn't look as if any of them are actually ready at the moment. They might be a bit camera shy. 
<laughs> <They might be. laughs> yeah. All right, Matthew, well, thanks yeah. ever so much for bringing Thank Cyril you. down. No problem at all. Uh, I, we'll I, keep you posted on, uh, on developments. Yeah, well, I look forward to see how he gets on. You know, it'd be nice to see his offspring. A week's passed since Peter commissioned the granite trough. He's returning to the quarry to see how they've got on. Is it taking a long time? A lot of work? About a week. Right. A week and a half. Fair old time. Yeah. yeah. So you're talking a lot of hours gone into it. Yeah. That is a work of art. One, two, three. Now Alex and Peter can deliver it to their flock of sheep. Yeah, I think you've got the short straw here. Well, anything but lift it, mate. It's... <laughs> Wait. <laughs> so, what do you think of the trough, then? Well, <laughs> I have to admit, when I first saw it, I thought, that's not a trough, Peter, that's a bird bath. <laughs> yeah. But in fact, it, uh, it's heavier than me, so I'm already learning to respect it. Now, we could just put the feed on the ground. The danger is you're putting hard feed on the ground is that they come into contact with their own droppings, and the droppings can carry worms. The worms get inside the stomach, start eating the food away, and then your, your animals, basically, they become emaciated, and with winter setting in, they'll die. So the trough is critical for hard feeding. Woo! There we go. Fantastic. <laughs> I was really sceptical about uh, Peter's uh, granite trough endeavours, but um, I have to admit, it's, uh, it's the ideal trough to feed your animals from the field. It's, it's heavy weight, so they're not going to knock it over. It's going to be there for decades. So, yeah, all in all, I think that was a good idea. It's late September. After a long search, Alex and Peter have found a smaller lime kiln that should produce the 10 tonnes of quicklime they need. Colin Richards is a quicklime expert and will supervise the burn. So this is it, yeah? This is it. I, th I think this is far more manageable. In this kiln, limestone will be heated to 900 degrees. Easy to, to fire, so hopefully at the end of the four days here, you'll have some lime to be able to use on your project. Fantastic. Stafford Holmes helped restore the kiln and will be in charge of loading it. Well, these are certainly in much better condition, these kilns, than the ones we've got down in Morwellum. Well, they should be. They've been very carefully repaired. When were these kilns in operation? Uh, the last time they were burnt uh, continuously mm. um, was probably around the 1950s. So th this is limestone and we need to turn this into quicklime. That's right. And how do we do that? We apply heat to it, basically, and uh, that involves, with this kiln, creating a, a fire at the bottom, which we start with wood, then we put a layer of coal, and then layers of limestone, layers of coal, right up to the top of the kiln. Well, I suppose the fumes are, are toxic coming out of the top. That's right, yes. It's something which, you know, you have to respect. The whole process, yeah. you know, involves a lot of chemistry, but the, the reality is it's a very caustic material. It can burn your skin. So we've got to be very sensible about the way we go about this. It's Peter's job to ensure the critical first layer of limestone is spread evenly. Right. Watch yourself. Good. Next, a layer of coal. Then another layer of limestone. It will be 25 shovelfuls. Stafford's concerned that unless the amounts in each layer are precise, a constant 900 degrees won't be maintained and no quicklime will be produced. So we're looking at quite a few layers here, aren't we? Total of 15 layers of fuel and 15 layers of stone. 100 kilograms, 20 shovels. So every shovelful is counted in. 18, 
But the level of precision necessary means the loading is taking longer than the boys had hoped. By early evening, there's barely a ton loaded. Moon's out. Let's hope we've got enough moonlight. It's late, and the kiln's barely half full. Loading it by hand is taking its toll. 28. 30. Oh, no, stop. 31. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> He's becoming delirious. <laughs> yeah. 33. Doing this completely by hand has given us a real insight into what it must have been like to load these things. I mean, they would have had trains delivering the materials here but I wouldn't have been surprised if these have to be stacked in this way, that it would have been a man with a shovel doing all this work. After 18 hours of shoveling, 12 tonnes of limestone and 3 tonnes of coal have been loaded. There we go. That's it all in. Finally, it's time to light the kiln. You ready for an ember, yeah? Where do you want it? Just here? Yeah. The paper, yeah. Just get the paper going. Getting exciting here. And it's, it's, it's starting to go. Gases produced by burning limestone include the deadly carbon monoxide. Wow. There's no going back there. It's as if somebody down below is stoking some... Hellfire. Yeah, some hellfire, <laughs> some mysterious brew, really, isn't it? During the 19th and early part of the century, when there was a lot of rural poverty around, people who were on the road would come and sort of sleep around the kilns. And if the carbon monoxide rendered them unconscious and they turned over, rolled into the furnace, there was no way back. They were roasted alive. Now they must take it in turns to keep watch on the lime kiln for three days and three nights. Oh, oh my word. Oh. You can just really get a sense now of what it would have been like to have been lime burning in these kilns over 100 years ago. But as they check the fire below, it's clear all's not well. Fire is burning too low. We need it to be burning higher. We should see glowing cherry red limestone. At the moment, we just see blackness, darkness, and it's all cold in there. They need to get as much air into the kiln as possible to make it burn hotter. If the fire goes out now, it would be disastrous. Back at Morwell and Key, Ruth's cooking up a treat for their return. Sheep's head stew. This is one of the most gruesome things I've ever had to do. Now, the recipe I'm using comes from um, this fantastic little booklet called The Best Way. Um, the cheapest cookery book in the world, it says. <laughs> After preparing the head in the usual way, Put it in a stew pan with the tongue and cover with the water. That whole sentence, prepare the sheep's head in the usual way, it really points out what a common dish this was for the less well off. Unsurprisingly, the head of the sheep is pretty much the cheapest cut on it. So if you've got to buy meat, or if you um, have got beasts and you need to sell most of them on, this is pretty much the cheapest cut. Um, there is quite a lot of meat on it, though. Funny enough, in the Edwardian period, people were doing this a little bit less than they had before. Ship technology and refrigeration technology began to make it possible for meat to be brought halfway around the world. And frozen lamb from Australia and New Zealand began to become the sheep meat of most ordinary Britons rather than our native homegrown sheep. Because with New Zealand lamb being cheaper, you could actually have a lump, a joint, 
for the same sort of price as you might have for something like a head. This sort of idea of getting as much as possible out of a really small amount of meat is such a theme through Edwardian cooking. People are mostly living on really starchy, solid things like large bowls of potato, lots of bread, lots of oatmeal, which is cheap and fills you up. But of course, it's a really, really bland, boring diet. So a little bit of meat, even if it's something like a sheep's head, just adds so much flavour into these really, really boring, stodgy basics. For two days, the lime burners have been tending the kiln, trying to get as much air into the fire as possible. But Colin's still concerned. The worry is that if there's not enough air going in, it can actually go out. So we would have to shovel everything out and that would be a failure. Yeah, yeah, it would be raking it out. We had a big hole to put it in at the top. Yeah. And a little one to get it out at the bottom. Yeah, so it would take a, ages. It would. All they can do is hope their efforts haven't been in vain. There's one sure way to test whether this limestone's been burnt or not, and that's to add it to water. Mm. And if it's been burnt through, it should slake. If it hasn't been burnt through, it will just remain as a stone. OK, let's see it go in then. Mm. Not a lot going on there, is there? There it goes. Wow! There it goes. Look at that! <laughs> That's excellent. It's amazing. That's the transformation from limestone to quick lime to lime putty, which is what we're after. And if the rest of the kiln's like that, then we're in business. It's the third day of the burn, and all the limestone should have turned into quick lime. Now the dangerous part, unloading the kiln. Quicklime dust reacts violently with moisture, so if it touches skin or is inhaled, it will burn. Time for some Edwardian health and safety. As I am likely to sweat an awful lot whilst doing this because of the heat of the kiln and just the physical activity, I've made myself some protective gear. So I have my hood. People will laugh, but I think I shall have the last laugh. I even made myself some mittens. Long sleeve numbers. Oh. I've got an apron here. I'm going all out for this. Can't see a thing. <laughs> last thing, goggles. If I say goggles, they're more like shades. <laughs> There we go. I'm ready to deal with a quick line. <laughs> Let me take these off so I can see. <laughs> You're like a giant teddy bear. <laughs> right, well, with all that gear then, I suppose you should be the one that's right in at the, uh, the stoke hole, yeah? Yeah, the coal face. The burn should have produced 10 tonnes of quick line, all of which must be unloaded by hand. It truly is an awful job. The mesh is used to separate the quality quicklime from the spoil. Ah, this is killing me. Probably quite literally. Right. So here we go, it's the final process of the day. This highly caustic substance is going into our barrel and then we can get this back to the farm, but it's an absolute joy to have got so far. Here we have it, caustic lime. It's what we came for and it's what we can come away with. After three days of back-breaking work, they've produced 10 tonnes of quick lime. Now they must get it onto the field. 
scared of the boy. This is what it's all about. This is why we did the line burn, to get this on the fields. Stand still. Whoa, wait, 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 steady. Whoa, 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 steady. Steady, steady, boy. Whoa. It's been a long few days. Stand there, boy. But it seems that this fella's as new to lime spreading as we are. That's it. Ready? Aye, 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 steady. In Edwardian Devon, it was often part of a tenant farmer's contract to lime his fields to neutralise the acidic soil. This really does kick-start our arable project. We're getting the fertiliser on. This will start slaking. We'll work it into the ground. And then all of this lime will invigorate the organic matter in the soil and create that fertility that we'll need to grow our crops. Whoa, stand there. Just easy, easy, easy. It's all right, it's good. Rain's on the way. So they've got to work fast to avoid disaster. This is going to start slaking in the back of our, uh, our, our tip cart, which means the tip cart might catch on fire. There are accounts of these wagons full of quick lime, caught in a rain like this, whoosh. It's done. OK, last one. Yeah. Really good. With seconds to spare, they get the last of the lime onto the field. The exhausted boys have returned to the cottage. It's a chance to catch up with Roof over the sheephead stew. How'd it go? Very well, thank you. Very well, actually. Remarkably well. I have to say, Ruth, your rug looks tasty, but I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not normally queasy about food, but I've got to say... Well, I did wonder about taking the head out and not telling you what was in it. <laughs> Oh, but then I thought, I don't know, they're big tough boys. How they? cruel. <laughs> so, tell me about this line then. To be honest, there wasn't that much to see after the loading other than an awful lot of smoke. Mm. But the stuff we're getting out the bottom seems to be top notch. Yeah, and we've got some pretty good lime actually. So, are you pleased to have the cottage up and running now? Oh, I certainly am. It's marvellous. I only get it's... on with things. It certainly looks a lot more homely uh, than it did the first time you stepped in here. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> nice and warm as well, actually. That, that range is really kicking out. Yeah, I can feel that there. Can. I can feel that heat yeah, out of my hand. that's pretty good. I sort of feel now, you know, a month under our belts, it's all ready to start, isn't it? We've got all sorts of enterprises we've got to start kicking off. I mean, right. one of the big things, certainly in the Edwardian period, was this market garden. So we've really got to get our heads around that and how we're going to approach that in the, in the, in the coming months. Cheers. So we've got our rick, we've got all our hay there. You know, we are ready to start getting some more livestock in and, and we're, we're kind of prepped for winter, almost. Well, we've got the team all assembled, so uh, Edwardian Britain, here we come. Yeah, it's great to be back in the saddle. Well, it's all here, it's just a case of bringing it back to life.